Hi, I'm Danny. I'm education content lead for PE at Twinkle, which includes Twinkle Swim. So that's a swimming scheme of work that's aimed to help meet the end of Key Stage 2 swimming expectations and also PE Mastery, which is our brand new curriculum scheme. And that will be available for the 25-26 academic year. Some contents already available to use now, but the full scheme will be available from next year. Um, I'm passionate about PE and I'm really fortunate to have had a positive experience of this at school and it's led to lots of opportunities for me in later life, sort of both in work and socially. Um, I'm also really passionate about providing these positive experiences of PE for all learners because I know sort of firsthand the many benefits that it can provide in sort of like all aspects of life. Um, so yeah, just a quick run through of what's covered in this session. So we'll start with sort of a bit of a background information around PE, so defining PE school sport and physical activity, information on some guidance related to PE and some information on the importance of PE. Uh, next, we'll go on to take a look at progression in PE, so sort of how this looks across school from EYFS to Key Stage 2 but also sort of how to support progress within a lesson or within a series of lessons. Um, after that, we'll move on to look at inclusion in PE. So sort of some practical strategies that you can take away and hopefully implement straight away in PE lessons, along with sort of looking at adapting activities in some sort of specific scenarios. And then finally, we'll go on to look at enjoyment in PE, and then there'll be time for questions at the end. So, first of all, um, often there's confusion on what's meant by PE, um, school sport and physical activity. So, looking at PE first, PE is your sort of curriculum-based learning. So, this should be sort of planned progressive learning with a focus on developing skills. And it also includes curriculum swimming lessons. Then there's school sport. So, this is extra curricular and additional to what is included in PE lessons. So things like after school clubs, inter school competitions and intra school competitions. Um, and then finally, there's physical activity. So this is anything that's active and includes indoor play, outdoor play, active travel. So like traveling to and from school, physically active learning, for example, sort of measuring how far children can jump in a maths lesson and also things like movement breaks. So the chief medical officers recommend that all children are active for at least 60 minutes a day, with schools being responsible for delivering at least 30 of these active minutes. Obviously, the more the better, and this can be provided through any of the methods that are discussed on the previous slide. Um, the DfE School Sport Action Plan advises that schools should aim to teach two hours per PE per week, Although this is non-statutory guidance, it is strongly recommended and it's also one of the key indicators for PE and sports premium spending. So, yeah, let's think about PE. Why is PE so important and what are some of the benefits of it? If you don't mind, please, could you share some ideas in the chat at the side of your screen? Oh, yeah, sorry, Jess. So, oh, let me just go back one. Uh, why is PE so important and what are some of the benefits of it? Um, please just share some ideas in the chat. So, yeah, absolutely building team teamwork and team building skills, which is essential, not just in PE, but sort of across the wider curriculum as well. Um, yeah, breaking up learning, absolutely. Yeah, developing gross motor skills, which obviously sort of are essential in PE, but it also sort of helps with things like handwriting, um, again, sort of with that cross-curricular link. Yeah, keeping active, oxygen to the brain, helping other areas of learning, also helping sort of with concentration, helping reduce stress. Yeah, keeping healthy, 
communication, teamwork, and yeah, absolutely having fun. Um, one of the most kind of important things in PE, uh, if children enjoy it, they're more likely to go on to be active in later life. Um, so yeah, thank you. Loads of great ideas in the chat. Um, I've just listed a few here. Many of them have kind of been covered. Um, so I won't, I won't read them all out. I'll just sort of put that on the screen there. Okay, yeah. so first we're going to have a talk about progression in PE. So often people think of physical skills when we talk about progression in PE, but progression in PE is about much more than just the physical. So it includes progression across the three pillars, um, which are motor competence, rule strategy and tactics, and healthy participation. So quite often when we look at building a PE curriculum, um, we try and make these skills based rather than sports based. So focusing on the development of the key skills that are transferable to a range of contexts rather than looking at developing sports specific skills. So, for example, children might learn about jumping for height in one lesson and then they might transfer this learning to another lesson sort of on an intercepting a ball. So they might use the skill of jumping for height to jump an interceptable. And the idea is that kind of all the skills are transferable to a variety of different contexts. Um, if you then sort of are able to master these skills, you're then able to apply them in a wide variety of physical activities, which just opens the doors to sort of more opportunities for participation. Um, to ensure progression in PE, it's important to also try and follow a teaching for mastery approach. So many of you will be familiar with this sort of in maths, but you can achieve this in PE by embedding skills and consolidating them if necessary before moving learning on. So ensuring that all children are ready to progress. So for example, if the children's unable to underarm throw accurately, there's no point moving the learning on to throwing and catching with a partner because they won't be able to accurately throw the ball to their partner, which then makes um, catching difficult, so it's better to consolidate the sk skills of throwing for accuracy before moving on. So first of all, we'll just take a look at motor competence. So this refers to the development of physical skills. So things like locomotor skills, running and jumping, body awareness, so the control of your body and movements, form and body tension, stability skills, things like static and dynamic balance, Manipulative skills, so ball skills, object control, things like throwing, catching, dribbling, and also linking, combining, combining and applying movement skills in physical activities. Um, so as well as being essential for PE, these skills are sort of transferable to all sorts of everyday experiences and physical activities, things like play, mobility, and they also contribute to overall physical literacy. So building a strong foundation of physical skills will sort of enable children to apply and transfer them to a broad range of sport and activity specific contexts in later life. Um, so here you can kind of see how it develops throughout school. So starting with growth motor skills and fundamental movement skills. And really these are kind of what underpins everything in terms of future learning. Um, the fundamental movement skills have to be mastered before moving on to specialised movement skills and advancing the skills. Um, so here you can see, yeah, sort of EYFS, we're looking at growth motor skills, ne negotiating space, very simple sort of stability and control of movement and starting to just link very simple movement skills. Key stage one, you go on to develop this a bit more, looking for a bit more fluency when linking skills and applying skills in activities. Lower key stage two, you then expect to see mastery of fundamental movement skills, but then also moving this learning on. So where children might have mastered running, you then look at maybe specific sprinting technique, jogging, running for distance, um, and linking and combining skills more fluently. Um, the aim is that by the end of key stage two, all children are physically literate. Um, and that basically means that they have all of the physical skills required to kind of go on and participate in physical activity in later life. And ultimately, that is the aim of PE at primary school. Um, 
Next, there's rule strategy and tactics. So this is the second pillar. Um, and this is the execution and application of movement skills in physical activity. So things like understanding and applying rules, developing strategy and tactics in individual and team games, composition of movement sequences and routines, understanding and applying elements of dance, and also sort of developing creative and critical thinking skills in relation to problem solving. Um, so in order to be successful in physical activities, children need to learn how to tactically and strategically apply their physical skills. Um, it's really important to mention here as well, actually, that this pillar isn't just related to games-based activities, but it also does relate to performance activities. So, for example, like in dance, children learn to effectively use their body and space to convey emotions and meaning, and that is sort of your strategy and tactics in dance. Um, so as you can see here from the progression, kind of EYFS starts off very simple, just following simple rules, participating, working towards aims and creating simple movement sequences or spontaneously sort of moving your body to music. Key stage one, this sort of develops further into participation in team games applying really simple strategy and tactics, things like attempting to mark a player or attempting to sort of block a pass, um, and also sort of starting to create movement sequences to convey meaning and thinking a little bit about the movements that they use. Um, lower key stage two, go on to develop the skills further, um, looking at understanding and applying rules sort of in a bit more depth, um, children beginning to self-referee and manage games, and also beginning to learn and implement situation specific strategies. So things like maybe a one, two passing sequence um, and applying these in mini games. They'll also create longer sequences and routines. So considering and adapting elements of the dance fundamentals. So body, energy, space and time. And then upper key stage two adds even more complexity uh, and children will begin to learn the rules of some modified games and sports. Um, and also understand and implement more complex strategies in gameplay situations, um, as well as sort of refining these, reflecting on their success and working to sort of create strategy and tactics as a team. Um, they'll also create longer movement sequences and routines um, and also think about creating these for a given purpose or audience and justify uh, choices for their composition. And finally, healthy participation. So this is the third pillar, and this refers to how children participate in PE and also develop, develop sort of essential knowledge and skills. So things like emotional regulation, uh, and this includes healthy and safe participation, evaluation, reflection, and goal setting, understanding the importance of healthy and active lifestyles, which again is key to going on to leading sort of like lifelong activities active lives um, and also things like spirit teamwork attitude and respect to those key sort of sporting values or key sporting behavior um, as well as obviously being essential for PE many of these skills are really transferable to the wider curriculum and everyday life so not only will they help children in PE they'll also help in the wider curriculum um, there's a lot of sort of cr cross curricular links here as well. So learning about the importance of healthy and li active lifestyles will also link with learning in PSHE and science um, and also sort of gives children that knowledge and motivation to lead the active lifestyles. So in PE Mastery, our progression maps are split into three different strands, which are each of the three pillars of progression. So if you'd like to sort of see a more detailed breakdown of progression against each pillar, um, you can refer to these, and these are available on the Twinkle site. So if you just search PE Mastery progression map, you'll be able to find these and see sort of a more detailed breakdown of how that progresses from reception to year six. Now we're going to move on to look at progression within a PE lesson. So 
a warm up activity is a really, really great way to activate prior learning that's relevant to the lesson. So, for example, a lesson on jump shapes, the warm up could activate learning about body shapes because this knowledge will be required for the lesson. So, if they've previously learned about body shapes and balance, for example, activating the learning, um, getting children to sort of recall star shape, tuck shape will then be relevant to the learning about those various jump shapes. Um, a cool down is a great opportunity to consolidate the skills that have been learned and it's always important to include time for evaluation and reflection. So it's just an opportunity, doesn't need to be really long, just a couple of minutes at the end of the lesson. It can even be done during the cool down um, where children can reflect on their learning, celebrate progress and identify how to progress further. And this just really supports their metacognitive skills. So, yeah, when teaching a new skill, it's really, really important to allow plenty of time for children to practice this and refine this before moving on to applying it or before moving on to a future skill. Um, so just some sort of like really important points that will support children to make progress within the lesson. Um, model the skills that you're teaching. Um, give really concise and clear teaching points to so kind of just try and break it down to the very basics of what's needed. Allow plenty of time, as I mentioned, to practice and refine. Provide individual or group feedback if you notice misconceptions as children are practicing. It might not be necessary to stop the whole group or the whole class. There might just be sort of specific children that you can give targeted feedback to. Um, you can also ask children to provide feedback to each other. Um, one thing children can be really, really good at is kind of like giving peers feedback. And sometimes, no matter how much you try and explain it as an adult, it sometimes children just have a way of sort of communicating with each other and really getting that across and help. And obviously, there's more children in the class than there are adults. So it just sort of helps to sort of spread that feedback a bit wider. Um, and also allow isolated skill practice first and then allow practice in a simple game or activity. So just allow children to have a go at the skill, get used to it and then have a go at it in an activity. So just here on the right of the screen, you can see sort of some of the skills teaching from one of our lesson plans. So it has sort of clear visuals. It's got a breakdown of the teaching points and it's got some helpful hints and tips um, just sort of like extra advice that you can give to children to sort of develop that skill further. Um, another way that you can support progression in PE lessons is by using scaffolded activities. Um, so in PE mastery we use, we call them layered activities. So here's an example from a lesson plan. Um, layer one is like the simplest form of the activity. So this allows children to really familiarise themselves with the rules of the activity and how to play sort of in their most basic form. The next layer, so as you can see here, um, layer one is sort of throwing a catching underarm over the skipping rope, which kind of acts as your net. Layer two um, adds a little bit more complexity. So here it's kind of adding a bit of a competitive element once the children are familiar with the rules. And then each layer adds slightly more complexity. Then, by the end of the activity, children are able to apply and combine a range of movement skills alongside strategy and tactics. So you can see in this example where we go from a really simple sort of throwing and catching a ball over a net, you're then sort of applying agility skills, you're applying various different movement skills, as well as applying strategy and tactics to try and score points. Um, so it's quite clear to see the progression throughout that activity. And personal best is a really, really good way to sort of support and celebrate personal progression. So personal best challenges are designed to recognise and celebrate progress and achievement for all. So regardless of a child's starting point. Um, and it also supports children to develop skills in like goal setting, evaluation and reflection. So these are open ended challenges, things like can you beat your previous score? Can you refine and improve your performance? So this might look like, can you complete more skips than your previous attempt? So it encourages children to compare their performance against 
previous ones rather than against others, which allows everyone to feel that sort of sense of achievement no matter where they've started. Um, so again, on our lesson plans, we kind of have personal best challenges linked to every activity. You can see an example here. So can you increase the distance that you can roll the coit or rugby ball? Um, can you increase the number of times that you can bounce and catch the ball without losing control? Um, can you improve your control when rolling the ball around your head? So all of these are focusing on how each individual child progresses and encourages them to compare themselves against themselves rather than against how others are doing, um, which in turn this develops confidence. So next we are going to have a quick look at inclusion in PE. So this is really broad and therefore we can't possibly sort of cover everything um, and every scenario, but hopefully what I can do is give some practical strategies um, that can be sort of tailored to learners in your setting, in your class, to ensure accessibility and inclusion for all. So when we talk about inclusion in PA, we mean ins ensuring that sort of all learners are able to access the lesson and make progress and sort of have a suitable level of challenge so it's not just being able to access the lesson it's being able to kind of make progress and have a suitable level of challenge too so yeah when talking about inclusion in PA, the step model is an absolutely fantastic tool for adapting and tailoring activities um, yeah i feel like it's such a good way to sort of transform your teaching and make your teaching really sort of appropriate for those children in the class. So STEP stands for space, task, equipment and people. And it's a really sort of simple way of modifying activities. Um, and sort of it also because it supports inclusion, it then aids engagement, motivation and progress. So all our PE mastery lessons provide guidance on how the step model can be used to modify and adapt activities. I'll sort of show a bit more information on that later on. So first, the space. Um, and here we're thinking about if the space is accessible and safe for all participants. So we consider things like how will the surface affect the task? So for example, balls will bounce higher or roll further on a hard floor than they would on grass. Will the environment affect children's ability to hear instructions? So like, is the space echoey, particularly swimming pools? Is there additional background noise? So things like, is, has your outside PE space got traffic noise? And will instructions be clear for everyone? Um, just consider maybe where children are standing as you're giving instructions, give some sort of visual support. Um, Modelling is a great way to do that. Um, will the environment create a sensory barrier for any children? If so, how can this be reduced or removed? Is the size of the space appropriate to children's abilities? So this could include things like moving targets closer, moving targets further away, or reducing the distance that children are traveling. And also sort of consider how the space is set up. So are there any learners that might benefit from having their own space? Are there any learners that maybe you're best to keep away from other learners? So consider sort of where their groups are as, as they're participating. Um, a sort of example of this, I suppose, is in a lesson with an attacking skill focus, you could make the area smaller and that would provide more challenge for attackers. So the reason that would provide more challenge is because it reduces the space for them to move into. So I suppose on the flip side of that, if you increase the size of the area, attackers have more space to move into, therefore sort of simplifying the task. And all these adaptations can be done on the spot. You might have one group with a bigger space, one group with a smaller space, and you can adapt activities kind of based on the children's needs. Um, the T, so this is the task. Uh, so we need to think like, does the task provide an appropriate level of challenge and is it accessible for all learners? So it might be rules need removing, adding or adapting to make the task appropriate. So 
for example, like a mini basketball style game, you might adapt the rules to allow some children to dribble with two hands rather than just one because they haven't quite got the control dribbling with one hand. Or for a child in a wheelchair, you might allow one bounce, catch, one push, one bounce, catch, one push. Or you might say they could carry the ball for three pushes before passing, depending on um, their needs and their ability. Um, and then think, do the movements required for the task offer an appropriate level for cha of challenge? So not every child needs to be working on the same movement, even though they're doing the same task. So for example, if you're learning about full turn jumps, you might find some children aren't actually yet able to do a half turn. So for these children, it would be more appropriate to focus on a half or quarter turn movement first, while others are focusing on full turn jumps. And then is the time limit appropriate? Does it present a barrier? So you might increase or decrease a time limit, or you might remove it completely to remove sort of that pressure. Um, if there's an element of competition involved, again, this could provide a barrier for some children. Focusing on personal best, um, is a really sort of good way to remove this barrier and sort of encourage children to look at how they're doing rather than how they're doing compared to others. Um, like, can they beat their score from the previous round? Even if they don't win the game, have they improved and celebrate that progress? Um, and ultimately, does the task allow all children to experience success and also to make progress? If not, you will need to have a look at the task and change certain elements. You might completely modify the activity. So if you were doing a jumping for distance activity, a child in a wheelchair might perform one push to travel as far as they can, or the task might be modified to thrown for distance, to, again, depending on the child's needs. The um, Next one is the equipment. So when thinking about the equipment that you use, um, yeah, first of all, think, does it make the activity accessible for everyone? Does it provide an appropriate level of challenge for everyone? So things like, is the equipment being used the correct size for all children? Um, particularly things like using appropriate size balls for their age. Uh, the correct size tennis rackets, which might vary. You might have some children in your class that are taller. They need to use sort of longer tennis rackets and others that use shorter. And things like, are they using the correct skipping length skipping rope for their height? Um, think as well about in your class, are there any children that would benefit from alternative equipment or specialist equipment? So this is something you could speak to external specialists about. Um, occupational therapists or physiotherapists and also sort of speak to your Senko about being able to have access and purchase this equipment if required. Um, is the equipment familiar to the children? Do they need sort of information and guidance on how to use it, on how to hold it? Um, are there any children that would benefit from visual cues, so skill support posters? Um, yeah, so things, I guess, ways that you could adapt the equipment things like using lighter or slower moving equipment balloons are really great for this um and they're nice and slow moving um and that just makes it a bit easier for children to track them slightly deflated footballs as well they move slightly slower so it just gives children a little bit more time to anticipate where they're going um and also things like sensory equipment can be really great for supporting learners as well And finally, people. So this is, this relates to the people that are involved in the activity, adults and children. So thinking about the group size, thinking about are all children actively involved? So things like reducing the group size can allow each child to have more opportunity um, and sort of more opportunity to be heard as well. If you've got a defending focus, you might actually find it beneficial to have more defenders than attackers to kind of allow children to practice the skill with less challenge. Is there anyone that's unable to physically participate due to injury? And I think this is a really important point that those children can still participate, even if they're not physically participating. So they could take on the role of coach um, or maybe sort of a 
manager, de um, depending on the activity. So all of our lesson plans, again, contain suggestions for how to achieve this. And yeah, consider how the children are grouped. Do you want to have them in sort of mixed ability groups? Do you want the children to choose their groups? Are the teams even and fair that are playing against each other? Um, and are there any participants that would benefit from pre-teaching or additional support? So we're gonna have a quick look at a scenario now. Um, so how could this activity be adapted using the step model? So this is just a really simple sort of target throwing activity with a Frisbee. So the players line up um, in an even number behind one of the starting cones, approximately four meters away, the other cones are. Players take it in turns to throw their flying discs so it lands behind the line of cones. Um, using the step model um if you don't mind please could you pop some ideas in the chat of how this activity could be adapted to either increase or decrease challenge Yeah, absolutely. Moving the cones further away will add challenge. Moving the clones closer will sort of decrease the level of challenge. Fantastic. Yeah, again, yeah, throwing the distance, changing the distance. Fantastic. Yeah, heavier or lighter discs. Yeah, absolutely. Dif different team sizes. If you were looking at wanting to sort of increase participation, depending on the space available, you could have sort of just in pairs and children could coach each other. Um, here's some of the sort of ideas that are included on our lesson plan. Um, yeah, absolutely as well. Bigger or smaller discs, depending on hand size. Um, and sort of one of the suggestions here as well is using a coit, which supports with grip, because you can obviously sort of grip all the way around, or using a bean bag. Um, lighter and higher discs, heavier discs, so things like foam discs would be lighter. Um, making increasing the size of the target, using an underarm or overarm throw for those children that aren't yet able to do the backhand throw, um, adding additional targets to increase challenge, um, providing step-by-step -step cues. So this could be done by an adult or a peer. And yeah, absolutely, that's great. Yeah, having a collector for those with mobility issues. So not all children might be able to go and collect the Frisbee, but there could be a peer or perhaps a non-performer that is able to go and collect them. Um, and then this next scenario is kind of looking at, I suppose, more of a specific scenario. So how could you adapt a striking activity in rounders for a pupil that's really finding it difficult to connect with a moving ball? Yeah, absolutely. So a standing post for the ball, something that the ball's balanced on. So that ball is now stationary, makes it easier for that child to then connect with the ball with their bat. Again, a bigger ball or like greater surface area of the bat. So you might swap the rounders bat for, say, a tennis racket, just makes it slightly easier to connect. Yeah, the ball on a cone or a base, absolutely. Again, it's sort of then you're using a stationary ball rather than a moving ball. Um, you could also look at using sort of slower moving objects um, or sort of connecting with it sort of from a, um, like I said before, sorry, with a larger surface area. So we're just going to have a quick look now at how P Mastery sort of can support inclusion. So it's been developed with inclusion really at the heart of the scheme and at the heart of every lesson. So 
every lesson plan contains specific modification guidance on the overview as well as sort of suggested activities for non-performers and there's a couple of examples here Then each activity also contains step guidance, which shows various different ways that you can increase and decrease challenge and also support inclusion. And then alongside that, we also have an inclusive support pack. So there's inclusive support resources for every lesson. Um, and that includes a visual learning sequence, which is essentially a visual timetable of the lesson. Um, and for children that might benefit from that being broken down more, we've got now and next board cards, which are the exact same sort of, it's the exact same breakdown, but it just then has your now card and your next card just to sort of break the lesson down into even smaller chunks. Um, we also have skill support posters. So these can be displayed on a tablet or they can be printed out that are just sort of a visual reminder and a visual prompt to children on the technique. Um, and we've also got adaptive teaching guidance for sort of specific situations. So there's adapting gymnastics for accessibility guidance, there's ball skills and the information on how to adapt that. Um, just really to try and support teachers with various different ways, because obviously we don't know the needs of every child in your class and we can't possibly provide every single sort of situation but what we can do is kind of provide guidance on different ways that activities can be adapted to support children um yeah and then finally moving on to enjoyment in pe so yeah first of all why is enjoyment in pe so important um i'm sure all of you sort of coming along to this teach me today um probably agree with me that it is extremely important um but please could you just share your ideas in the chat about yeah why you feel PE is really important Yeah, so promotes lifelong love of physical activity and obviously that has numerous health benefits as people age and really sort of supports overall health and well-being, not just physical health, also sort of mental health, um, which is so important. And I think if we can get that right at primary school and children leave primary school with a love of physical activity, they're much more likely to participate in physical activity in later life. Um, Yet yeah, great for mental health and dysregulation. It's also proven to sort of reduce stress um, and obviously releasing endorphins. Yeah, same as the other subjects. If they enjoy it, it keeps them in task. It boosts engagement um, and therefore will boost progress. And yeah, set, sets children up with great attitudes to physical movement, physical activity, which is so beneficial in later life. Yeah, builds confidence allows children to shine outside of the classroom and yet experience that sort of feeling of achievement in physical activity. Yeah, loads of really great ideas, thank you. Um, so yeah, just a few sort of bits of information from the Children and Young People Survey by Sport England. So enjoyment, I'm sure this is no surprise, is the biggest factor in motivating children and young people to be active. Those that enjoy PE are more likely to participate in physical activity and sport outside of school than those who don't. And those who enjoy PE are more likely to lead active lifestyles in later life. And we know the numerous benefits of that. So next, we're gonna just have a little think of the barriers to enjoyment in PE. So first of all, um, the emoji function at the bottom, uh, so it's like a little smiley face. Could you just share on there um, an emoji to show your feelings towards PE when you're at school and then if you feel comfortable to please could you share 
why you felt this way in the chat. So it might be positive, might be negative, might be sort of indifferent. Right, so it looks like a sort of real mix of different experiences of PE at school. Um, and I imagine sort of some of you might be, be able to relate to some of the barriers to enjoyment um, that I'm going to discuss. So um, I did a survey at the school I was teaching at last. Oh, so I've just got some bits through in the chat. Yeah, so feeling nervous in PE, particularly team games, worrying about letting others down. Um, yeah, that's something that a lot of people feel and confidence in PE is sort of such an important thing. And that's where the focus on personal best can really help because actually it's looking at how are you improving and not comparing yourself to others. Um, yeah, enjoying PE at primary school, but not at secondary school. And then that in turn putting you off sport and physical activity, which unfortunately negative experience of experiences of PE can do. Yet staff not knowing how to include people due to health issues. And again, then not being included kind of starts to build those negative attitudes towards PE because you don't get to experience that enjoyment. Thank you for sharing um, all of those in, chat, in the chat. So yeah, some of the barriers to enjoyment. So I did a pupil voice survey and um, kind of had some pupil discussions just to dig a bit further into sort of why are those children not enjoying PE? And at first you sort of got generic responses. Oh, I don't like it. It's boring. And digging a bit deeper kind of managed to sort of categorize the responses into sort of different things so confidence people feeling everyone's better than me i'm rubbish at it i hate it when everyone's watching me and a pupil voice survey is really great for sort of getting to know the attitudes in your school but also getting to understand the barriers and how you can sort of eliminate some of these fitness again can be sort of a bit of a barrier so I get out of breath and then I can't do it anymore and then feeling like they're letting others down um, and looking at ways to kind of improve fitness or for children to understand about sort of pacing themselves a bit more um, and understanding that different people have different levels of fitness. Social things, people being too competitive, children not feeling like they're ever in a team with their friends. Attitudes, one of the children said, well we're just not a sporty family and it's sort of that preconceived idea of oh well i'm, I'm not going to be good at it um and trying to sort of overcome those um lack of variation in activities so things like we always do football and it's not fair and actually ensuring that the experiences that children are sort of provided with are really varied and linked to what they'd like to do. So maybe trying new things, things like ultimate frisbee, something a bit different that children might not have experienced before. Um, getting changed as well, that can be a really big barrier for some children before they've even set foot in the PE space. They're already feeling quite anxious because they've had to get changed. Um, and then another one that, um, made me realize that some of the barriers can be so easily eliminated so we have to take our shoes and socks off because there's always food on the floor and this was someone that had a gymnastics lesson straight after lunch um and to be fair i can complete completely relate i wouldn't want to take my shoes and socks off and uh, stand on peas and mashed potato so that was actually something that we could really easily eliminate that barrier um, so yeah, pupil voice is a really great way to kind of find what the barriers are in your school and then work to overcome them. So yeah, some of the ways that we can enhance the enjoyment in PE, as mentioned, pupil voice, um, inclusive practice, which we've sort of gone over in the previous section, focusing on personal best, so celebrating personal progress. Um, and again, like I mentioned, this is linked to every activity in our scheme skills-based curriculum um, so rather than focusing on sports so 
not spending like a term on football, netball, um, but actually focusing on the skills, variation of activities, so providing children with opportunities they might not have outside of school, opportunity to practice different skills in a variety of contexts, healthy competition and embedding sporting values. So throughout our scheme, we have something called the star values and that's spirit, teamwork, attitude and respect and really embedding those key values and having them at the heart of every lesson to ensure there's sort of positive sporting behaviour that's being developed. So finally, how can PE mastery help achieve progression, inclusion and enjoyment? So I've gone over a lot of it, but just to kind of reiterate, it's a skills-based curriculum. The progression's broken down across the three pillars. There's clear guidance for teachers, including scaffolded activities and step guidance for adaptations, as well as inclusive support resources for every lesson. So if you want to find out a bit more, um, you can find it on the website. So it's just www.twinkle.co.uk slash PE Mastery. And then from there, you can explore everything we've got. And for the next academic year, the full scheme will be sort of ready to be used by schools. Um, yep, so I've just popped a few top takeaways. Um, obviously, we've gone over a lot of information um, and these are just, I suppose, the key bits to remember. So the step model, that's going to be your absolute best friend in modifying and adapting activities. Scaffolding activities, so building up complexity rather than going in at the most complex sort of layer allowing for practice and refinement of skills, allowing children to sort of master these, celebrate personal bests, celebrate every child's progress, provide a skills-based curriculum and teach for mastery. So that sort of real, getting those fundamentals really, really mastered before moving on. Ensure that you're encouraging progression against all three pillars of progression, not just most competence. Provide a really broad variation of activities whilst focusing on the key skills. Use pupil voice to develop PE in your school and work on sort of really embedding those positive sporting values and sporting behaviour. So, yeah, that's everything from me. Um, if there's any questions that have come through, I'll answer those now.